For those people who missed out on securing their copies of the Shadow of the Conqueror Enemies of Self graphic novel, there is a second chance Kickstarter campaign where you can secure your copies of not just the graphic novel but also the second edition novel. The collector edition covers are available as well as leather bound editions. This is a very limited second chance campaign that we were able to squeeze in before we go to print. So make sure you secure your copies now so you don't miss out because we are already hard at work producing the second volume of the Shadow of the Conqueror graphic novel series. Mike S. Miller, the phenomenal artist of this series, is already halfway done producing some amazing pages for the second volume, which is going to be over 120 pages. So you'll definitely want to get your hands on volume one, getting ready for volume two, which is already looking absolutely amazing. Thank you to everyone who has backed us so far. This is what has made making Volume 2 as good as it will be. We are hard at work making these books the very best quality possible. The leather bounds are going to have emboss and deboss effects with foils. They're going to be absolutely amazing. I can't wait to get you your copies. There is a link to the Kickstarter page in the description. And once again, thank you to everyone who has backed this campaign. Greetings, I'm Shad. And I have a passionate subject to talk about, which is sword pedantry. This is something I'm very familiar with because I think there is absolutely a place to be a bit pedantic about certain historical facts. But then we can clearly go too far to the point where we start to demand certain standards that are bizarre, unreasonable, and founded completely on bullcrap. Like, like the reasons why you should do X or not do Y nonsense and people kind of latch onto them as almost a means to exert their own intelligence and authority by being able to say well you should really do it this way when it's not the case at all and i'm going to go through some unique examples but i'm going to start with an interesting one that's already kind of gone through the sword community and thank goodness common sense won out in this instance but not in every instance but in this one it did and i was with a unique debate about which way should you block an incoming sword strike with a medieval sword. You don't have a back edge that's blunt and blocking with the edge will damage the edge. So then should you even block with the edge at all? In actual fact, there was a couple of people who became very passionate that no, no, you should always block with the flat of the blade because you're not gonna damage the edge that way. It was a very insistent thing and, they, and there was even claims of it being, this is how they did it historically. And thank goodness, common sense did win out, because in reality, there's some unique interesting elements about just the biomechanics of blocking. If you block with the flat, well, the flat's more flexible and has a higher chance of, you know, breaking your structure and breaking through. But if you block with the edge, you have far more structure to be able to knock or stop a sword strike. And if you're actually in the heat of a, a real battle, your life is of greater importance than the welfare of your sword. And a lot of people just kind of realize the common sense that, no, 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 I, I really, in the heat of battle, you're gonna do what is most effective in the combat situation that gives you higher chances of winning. But this is the actual reality. Do what you like doing. If you like blocking with the flat of your strong, that's the meme. If you know the history, flat of my strong, that's kind of, there was the death knell of that where it just got memed into oblivion. Flat of my strong. If you want to do it that way, fine! Do it that way! But don't say, to everyone should, if you're doing it with your head, you're wrong! You're not historical and you're not a true so oh, I'm, I'm exaggerating it, but that's kind of the underlining thing. This isn't just the only example, right? There are co common ones, even right now, that people are trying to perpetuate. And you might have figured out what some of those were by the cold open and by this, this beautiful display of weapons behind me. This so is just. Mwah. This is like a work of art. I actually, I think it actually has more, more effort put into it than a lot of modern art pieces. And if you're going to judge art by what can cause an emotional reaction in people, this is, this is legitimate art. My goodness. Don't you think so, Nate? I mean, it definitely evokes a, a, a emotional a response. A response. <laughs> it is interesting because there are certain things that get repeated a lot that when people then contradict or do against they actively cringe at for what 
I have a very valid reason why I cringe right, at that. Right, this though. one in particular. That one in particular. I has have, some validity. It does. But not universally. No. So, like, the reason that I cringe at that is the club, my club and I, we do training on grass. And if you stick that into the grass and it happens to be a burr, or you happen to stick it into dog poop or something like that, mm. then you've got a chance of causing injury. But in warfare, that's a better thing. And sticking a sword into a ground... If you don't have anything to lean it against, no. and you just need your hands free, it's a very functional thing you can do. It's still going to make me cringe. I, that's the thing, because it's the constant repeating that you should never do this. That causes people to be like, ah, what are you doing? But the reality is, right, the potential damage that can come to the sword is equivalent to doing this. Actually, that's probably worse. This is probably worse. Okay, why? Your hand is greasy, it has salts in it and everything like that. And acids. And, yeah. and acids. If you do not clean it, that area is going to rust really quickly. Actually, I've got a very good example of that. The helmet video that we just did, I happen to have my helmet here with all the handprints from not even a week ago. So a, yeah, let's, let's let me grab that. Perfect, perfect example. So even here, like there, you can see all the little bits and pieces of rust on it. But like this part here is just from when I was talking about armor angling and I mm. must have had a greasy finger. Yep. Um, same here, this big spot here was like when I was talking to Tyrant about where it was gonna hit. Mm -hmm. And then these marks here are just from me. Yep. I'm gonna have to clean it, I didn't clean it last time. Mm. Just from me doing that. And, and this is the reality of carbon steel. Carbon steel will rust and fingerprints are particularly, you know, are potentially damaging. They are. But is there any complaints about it being on the ground? No, actually we do this at training all the time. Because this is the interesting thing, right? The moisture in the ground is going to be less damaging to the potential rusting of the sword than to actually touching it. Yes. Even spitting on the blade like I did in the... Right? <sighs> and you know, another thing, that bothers me, and yet, and yet, that's how I clean my blades when I clean them with wet and dry. You see? And there's another element to this where people will cringe because you're disrespecting the blade. I'll talk a bit more about that a, a little later because you don't get to dictate what someone else does with their sword, okay? That's if true. If you want to respect it, you can respect it however the way you want, all right? But there, I've literally met some people where never even, like, finger on the blade. It's like, don't, don't, don't ever touch it. And even touching it, right? Yes, it's potentially damaging. You know what you do afterwards? Clean it. Clean it. Mm. That's all we have to do. And it's not a problem. And, you know, like, cleaning? There is, I, I really feel like going and getting the WD-40. Yeah. <laughs> oiling it will protect it even more. It will. And you do proper cleaning afterwards. And yes, the most potential problem with stabbing in the ground is actually hitting rocks where it might dent it, because you can't predict where sense. rocks are in the ground. But if you want to take the gamble and you think you're on soft ground where there's no rocks, go to town. And the idea that it's first, Rust, then people will say it will blunt in the blade by stabbing it into the ground. The, the ground tiniest, is fairly soft. Yeah, the, maybe the tiniest time. No, it, to do it even once or a couple of times, the difference is going to be so negligible to not even notice in reality, right? You, you would blunt in a sword more, chopping a tatami mat, mm. okay, that is coarse and resistant than soft ground. Easily. Now, if it's really hard ground, it might be different. Well, if you're stabbing it into stone, in, 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 Yeah, yeah, into different. rocky ground, right? And then, even if someone is aware of all this, right? You, I think it's no problem if they're not aware, just say, all right, here are the pros and cons yeah. about, about, you know, doing that. But once they know, they can do whatever the freaking hell they want. Yeah, if it's their sword, then, and they have certain rules around their sword, then that's yeah, fine. But yeah. if, like, that's your sword and you pass it to me, be like, oh, you can throw it in the ground. Exactly, if this was someone else's sword, right? Yeah. I would be respecting it as I, I don't know what conditions they have about their own sword maintenance and care, and so I wouldn't do this with someone else's sword. No, but your own blade. But if it's my sword, can I do whatever the frickin' hell I want with it? I can snap it in two and throw it in the trash if I want it. It's mine. I have caveats if it was a historical replica with actual greater significance. Yes. But if it's just something that you bought online and it was made for you and it's yours or whatever, and, and it's a monitor thing. It's yours. Do what you want. You did bring up a point before about edge versus flat. I might mm -hmm. grab Tyrant and we'll see if we can get something ready with a couple of actual action shots of that for later. I'm what do you think? to see, yes. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Tyrant! So there are definitely better practices that you can do to help maintain the quality of your sword, like cleaning them regularly, keeping them oiled. Uh, you could just avoid touching the blade altogether if you want to avoid the fingerprints, but it doesn't mean you can't ever do it. But if you do it, yeah, clean it. This is objective, actual, factual things that will help, you know, you maintain your sword quality. But then there is 
pseudo-intellectual bullcrap that people per perpetuate for the sake of keeping a sword from getting damaged or blunt and everything. And interestingly enough, a good number of them arose from my recent Katana video. And I was, I was quite amused at, at some of these, okay? Where unironically, what I did just then, you should never do like, I don't know because you should never do that. It would damage your sword. And I was like, are you kidding me? Have you ever handled a sword, right? You would need to do it so much more forcefully to potentially damage the sword or the sayer, right? Or even if just like that, see this? Is it, is it triggering you? Is it triggering you? It's my sword. I can freaking choose how to put it in the thing. And also that's not going to do any considerable, acknowledgeable damage over the short term, all right? And it's even questionable if it would do damage over the long term, because if it's a well-made sword, it's sturdy, this is fine, okay? If you don't want to do it, good. But to try and perpetuate a, a, like a complete bullcrap that doing this is going to damage the sword in a short period, or even at all, is nonsense. Now you might say, well, I did it and it damaged mine. Well, maybe your scabbard or sheath or whatever you say up was weak uh, or anything like that. And even if you want to continue telling people, it's their choice, okay? And honestly, honestly, all right? Having handled swords for many, many years, it's nothing. It's like, <laughs> it's not damaging, I can observe. I've done it for a very long time. Literally, I'm even like, um, uh, this one, it's really hard because you can do that. Trying to get it in the sheath is a bit, you know, thing, but like, okay. Done it for a very long time. Never damaged it at all. And so a lot of these, you know, supposed sword things where they say, you should do this or XY, can be debunked by your own direct experience. The other one that people were quite vocal about, a lot of people believed this piece of bullcrap, so I'm interested to know where this comes from, right? Is that katanas should never be displayed edge down. And I'm not kidding, the reason why they gave it is because holding it edge down will damage or blunten the blade. And I was just like, who on earth is spouting this bullcrap? Like, I know how strong carbon steel blades are. I've used them for a while. And having it simply rest in this position will not damage it or even blunt the blade. To, like, it, and even if it was it, like blunted it to the smallest degree, it would be so insignificant that you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. And in actual fact, if you really wanted to talk about this, right? Drawing the, the sword, even upside down, and because when you draw it upside down, right? And uh, you angle it, the blade still rubs against the top of the sheath in a lot of instances, okay? Drawing it like this will have such an insignificant, negligible amount of damage on the edge, blunting the edge, right? But even that, it would do more in blunting the edge than just having the sword rest with it blade down. And also, it's not like they're sitting blade down and they're constantly rubbing it. No, they're just sitting like that. It would not damage or blunt the blade at all, just sitting. Like I said, you will blunt the blade more when you actually draw it. And oh, so you're saying you should never draw the sword from the sayer now? Holy crap, it's nonsense. And you know the other thing that'll blunt a blade infinitely more than having it rest blade down? Chopping a tatami mat. I mean, my goodness. And so this level of pendantry is such useless, nonsensical bullcrap that I am quite interested in who started perpetuating it. And this one in particular strikes me as the type of thing that people kind of use to present their knowledge and authority. It's the kind of thing that was bred out of maybe tradition where it got repeated once and then repeated again and again and again and again to the point where they latched on as this interesting factoid that makes them look more authoritative and knowledgeable on the topic. It's bullcrap. Oh, they're testing the edge versus flat. Let, let, let's see the results, shall we? We have Nate and Tyranth here, just to quickly demonstrate a very significant difference between edge versus flat, uh, just to show you how nonsense the whole, you should never block with the edge, because there's another very significant point, Nate. Uh, which way is the crossguard pointing on a sword? 
I think it's that way. That the same I same direction as the edge? I think it's that way. Same direction as the edge. That might cause some very important biomechanical interactions between the blades. I usually like keeping my knuckles, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. which we'll find out about in a let's, second. Let, let, let's watch and find out. Okay. Go again just to get a couple of cuts. Um, and now I'm going to do it on the flat so the thing is going to bounce. Oh, wait, wait, hold it, hold it. That, like, when that was angled up. Yeah, that was on my knuckles. That was resting on your knuckle. And the cross guard tried to block it. I, can, I can try to lean back to get yeah. the exact angle, but the problem is I lose structure in my wrist. I need to pull my wrist in for strength. <laughs> that's my thumb. <laughs> that's your thumb gone. This has purpose, but that's better most of the time. And so if you want to block with the side, like a flat, or even the back if it's a single edge sword, do it as you want, but if it's going to be more expedient, or if you feel it'll be more expedient, blocking with the edge, do it with the edge. It's fine. How about, given that it's so hot, we pull the table to here, because yeah, this is nice this and is, shady. This is so much better. We'll do it here. Yeah. <laughs> now, there is a different discussion about this in regards to tradition. If there is a traditional historical way that was more often done, and I say more often for an important caveat, right, then if you want to be a respectful tradition, that's fine. But if you actually like the look or you want it, you know, whatever way you want, do it the way you want. But I was very specific with my wording when I said more often done historically, because one thing that I've learned in studying history, you, you should rarely draw universal absolutes and say it was always done X or Y. Because in a lot of instances when you do that, sometimes you do a bit more research, you can be completely debunked and completely false. And the other thing is that people historically, they're people, okay? If someone did something different, even stupid with a sword in the modern day, it's probably very likely that someone in the past did it as well, because uh, they use swords more often, they were far more prevalent in their time. And it's not to say that there perhaps wasn't far more common things historically, and it's also fine to say that if there's no evidence at all for something, it doesn't mean just because of the possible and likely exceptions you can just say, well, it's clear that medieval people had elephants in their home because, you know, absence of evidence isn't evidence of evidence, it's absence, absence of evidence, and uh, there's nothing contradicting it. Like, of course, you can take that philosophy way too far. But there are definitely reasonable, not out of the ordinary things that people might do historically that they just wanted to do, and then going over top saying you should never display a sword edge down, if they try and appeal to it, the practical reasons that I've mentioned, those reasons are false. It's not that you would never blunt in a sword by having it rest edge down to any degree that is worth even acknowledging, okay? But if it's a traditional thing and you want to do it the traditional way, okay, you, you, know, I, you can promote that, but if the person still says, no, I like it this way, what are you going to do about it? Because there's another interesting thing that uh, came up was the side in which the katana points on a display like this. That when it's displayed with the handle pointing to the right, that was, uh, was it the way of war or the wartime, wartime display? There's interesting uh, like logic behind uh, this in regards to biomechanics. And if it was display displayed the other way, it was peacetime. The reason being, if you are right-handed and you wanted to grab a sword from a, uh, a thing and draw it as fast as possible, if you're right-handed, most people are, having the sword point to the right is one motion where you grab it and draw and you go. But having the sword on this side, if you're right-handed, you're going to have to grab it and switch hands or do something or just grab it like this and flip it around. So I can see the logic why such tradition might be the case. But what if you're left-handed? Do they honestly think that every single person in feudal age Japan would always adhere to such a specific thing like that? You think there was no one that just displayed it however the hell they friggin' wanted? <laughs> of course, all right? This is where tradition and appealing traditions can go way too far because then they can exaggerate how prominent something was, really was, historically. There's an interesting factoid that Nate actually brought to my attention was that People say there was a point in feudal Japan where samurai were forced to train with their right hand. This type of thing is interesting because it strikes me as a similar type of thing as uh, the interesting factoid people say that medieval people only drunk ale or uh, never bathed or something like that. Where 
you can find points in history where these kind of um, uh, you know practices did exist. You can find points in the middle period where ale was drunk a lot more than water, like in a city when a lot of the water sources were really, you know, bad and you could get sick by drinking them. And so at the very least, uh, drinking ale because of the process can get rid of the, you know, they didn't know germ theory. And th there would be cases where the working man, if they had the preference and it was available, they would be all happily drink ale. And sometimes it was really watered down and barely alcoholic at all, by the way. But they would drink that far more often than water and they wouldn't go around and sloshed because it was mostly non-alcoholic, because it was so, so small in it. But then to apply that universally over the entire medieval period, okay, in every single region, is complete nonsense. Just by the nature of people, to say that samurai would, were always universally forced to only fight with the right hand, right? I, one, that's not going to be over the entire history of the samurai in Japan. And two, even in times when perhaps it was a more active kind of practice, you really think there was not a single samurai in the entire of Japan that wasn't left-handed? Common sense can actually debunk a lot of these things that we apply far too universally. This goes to the same thing as facing the right or facing the left. Okay, if you want to kind of acknowledge tradition, perfectly fine, but to insist that that was the universal way it was done historically, one, I call bullcrap on, and two, People can display it however the hell they want, <laughs> right? It's their swords. And to say that you're doing something wrong, like what, wrong in what way? What universal truth are they offending by displaying a sword however the hell they want? Same thing with how you wear, say, swords. Like, this applies to both Japanese swords and medieval swords, right? Uh, if you're right-handed, usually you'll have the sword on your left side. But guess what? Sometimes people did it on the right. There are instances historically where it was more often on the right, specifically in Roman times, they had shorter swords and so they could do it on the right. And they say it's really difficult. Oh wait, oh wait, I, I, I just drew the sword, uh, you know. And uh, look, it might be a bit more fiddly, might be out of the way, but there might be instances where having a sword on the right, where, look, I can switch my hand, draw it fine, okay? And so that's not a problem. And if someone prefers it that way, to get bent out of shape and just think, oh, you're doing something wrong by having the sword on this side, is ridiculous. So one, there's preference. If, you, if they prefer it that way, let people wear the swords however the hell they want. And two, there's actually sometimes valid, practical reasons why they might want the sword on this side. Archery. Do you know having a long sword on this side, pointing out like this, when you're drawing, the string can often hit, the sword will fall in between the string and can mess it up, okay? And so, to avoid that, you either need to push the sword way over here, which is really harder to draw, or guess what? You can just keep the sword on this side. And you say it's pointing out, but the string is coming up at an angle, and so when you go to full draw, it's never going to hit the sword. Okay, and so you can be right-handed and prefer it that way because there's a, that's just one reason. There's a lot of reasons why someone might prefer having the sword on this side. So once again, to get better out of shape and try and, you know, adhere or, or promote that there is a universally correct way to do this is bullcrap. And it's annoying. A next interesting kind of over-pendantry that exists in the sword community is terminology. The names we use to define certain things. Some of them, I think, are valid in objecting to. Specifically when they are spreading misconceptions, okay? Uh, a good example is misidentifying the fuller. Like when they say, it's a blood groove. I think you're perfectly fine to that. Actually, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's called a fuller. By calling it a blood groove, you're actually perpetuating something that's completely inaccurate. That they will put on there, to allow the blood to drain off. Some even say by having a channel blood groove here when you stab someone, and it makes a channel to allow air to seep in to make it easier to pull the sword out of. But that's not the actual reason why um, grooves are put on blades. It's to reduce weight, but not structural rigidity. Okay, that's the main reason, and it's called a fuller. And so by saying it's a blood groove for the blood to drain off is wrong, it's nonsense. There are other interesting ones, like for instance, calling uh, Viking period swords, Viking swords. That one's mostly harmless, but there is a misconception you're perpetuating that these swords are only used by the Vikings when they're actually swords of the period that multiple cultures were using. But then there are ones where it doesn't matter, especially when it's not perpetuating any inaccuracy. Broadsword is an interesting one. 
People don't like the term broadsword when they refer to uh, medieval swords. Uh, they'll often refer to arming swords or even broad-bladed long swords like this as broadswords. The thing that historians and history enthusiasts can get bent out of shape with this is that there was a historical term broadsword that didn't refer to any of these swords. Uh, the term broadsword historically, when it appears, references what you would more understand as being a Scottish basket-hilted broadsword. But guess what? You know what those swords were also called historically? Claymores. And we call claymores only the big Scottish swords, but no, the one-handed Scottish basket broadswords were also called claymores historically. So we're then calling that broadsword wrong as well. Okay, what about rapier? Like people will say, you know, a, a swept hilt, thin bladed sword is a rapier. But more often, historically, that wasn't referring to that type of sword. In English, that's, that rapier was a term often referred to what we call side swords. And a rapier sometimes was even called a longsword in English. And you know longsword? Longsword isn't a term that was used commonly in English to refer to two-handed, you know, middle range kind of two-handed swords. They were sometimes called two-handed swords, bastard swords, but the actual long sword word referencing the historical thing more comes from German, which was Langschwert. They called it long sword in translation, but in English we didn't. So does that mean we should stop calling this? So the point about terminology, people called swords different things in different regions in the medieval period and different periods as well. And so which one takes precedence to call it this name when it was called a different name in a different region, even in English or in Germany or in other languages because we use other language names as well. Also, on top of that, English is a language that evolves throughout the period. And so if you spoke Middle English or early, it's like another language. You can't understand a thing of it. And terms that might have me meant long or broad or anything like that was probably pronounced completely different. There was a massive vowel shift that even pronunciation is completely different. And so if you see a word and you're reading it and it says, I don't know, two-handed sword or rapier or something like that in certain historical texts, you're probably pronouncing it completely different to what how they pronounce it. And so the quest for complete accuracy in sword terminology is fruitless. I, well, when I say fruitless, it's fruitless in terms of communication. It's really valuable to be educated on what historical you know, language was. That's great, I love it. But the purpose of language is to communicate, to convey to the person you're talking with understanding of what you're referencing. And the, that's the purpose, okay? And so it actually doesn't matter what any of these swords are called. You could call them a dingle hopper, right? And if that word association has become established in the language to the point where you're, the person you're talking to understands exactly the sword you're referencing when you say dingle hopper, guess what? That's the useful name to use. And broadsword, this is the reality, in common language, in common vernacular, has come to mean double-edged medieval swords more often than not. Okay, and only particular historical pendants like myself, I agree, I fall, I have portrayed as well, would understand broadsword to reference a Scottish basket hilt of broadsword, but even pedantic people like me have acknowledged and realized we've lost the fight because whenever we reference the sword that was often called broadsword historically, right, we by necessity have to caveat it with a Scottish basket hilted broadsword just so people know what sword I'm referring to because most people when they hear broadsword they're not going to think of that sword they're going to think of something like this to call people up and say oh you must uh, calling you know this sword x or y oh, you should never call it a broadsword it's, it's not actually useful now okay um, it's useful for historical accuracy education and things but the purpose of language is to be understood and this is the same like it's an interesting discussion about katana right because katana even the kanji was a term that just meant sword or really single-edged sword in japanese but in modern vernacular, and Metatron is the one who confirms this because he does he has a video on it, and he lives in Japan, he speaks it fluently, has said the katana now in modern you know use of the word, even in J Japanese, more often refers to this sword specifically, not every type of Japanese single-edged sword. Even though the kanji, the actual you know written you know symbol for it, well, it isn't used now to like. It's used in conjunction with other swords and so and other symbols to reference other swords and the kanji just even singular by itself in common language in Japan is referent is used in re in referring to a standard katana as we understand it in English. So this mentality of excessive pedantry when it 
is not only unneeded, but can actually be, well, this is the, the, the other part. It can be detrimental to the uh, quest to understand what the historical periods are really like that we like to emulate when we muck around with historical weapons. I had a very interesting controversy in the recent history here on Shadowversity regarding which side of the bow should you rest the arrow when shooting medieval longbow, because I found it very intriguing that a lot of medieval art, when I say a lot, I mean a lot of medieval art, depicts archers using a longbow, but also uh, short bows as well, with the arrow resting on what is called the outside of the bow, the right side of the bow, or over the knuckle, not the inside. The, the, the inside of the bow, or over, sorry, over the thumb, sorry, this is over the thumb, that's over the knuckle. So on the inside of the bow is over the knuckle, and uh, that is the conventional, more standard way that we see done in modern day target archery. But there's all this many art showing it on the outside. And I was really intrigued by that, and so I started exploring. And holy, my goodness, the crap storm that kicked up in certain archery communities online was amazing. I am not kidding. And people were accusing me of some pretty horrible things. And they were trying to say this is utter nonsense. They never did it historically. All the art depicting that way is exaggerated, which was a false, like a really un uneven standard because what makes you assume it was on the inside is then the correct way the art did it. What if that was exaggerated? But no, because it was a proper way to do it. And they were claiming one, I'm not kidding, that you wouldn't even be able to draw the bow with the arrow resting on the thumb without it falling off. That it would fall off most of the time and it's completely unusable and archery instructors were the ones saying that. Literally saying that this is impossible and by the way you can see in real time the issues of the sword on the side right? So I need to get that out of the way but literally saying this and I can do it with the thumb down is impossible. That would fall off and the easiest way is just to hold the thumb up when you do it and then lower it when you're ready to release. And there was so much egg on their face, so to say, that they even tried to gaslight me and say, we never said it was impossible when I have the quotes right here. <laughs> Like they literally said, uh, fall off most of the time. But then they shifted the goalpost saying, all right, all right, if you did it with a heavy war bow, you'll injure yourself. I've done it for years now. I'm up to 110 pounds, no injury. It is no more detrimental than the common risks you have when drawing heavy bows, because you can injure yourself drawing heavy bows regardless what side, okay? They're, 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 it can be dangerous if you don't do it right. And then they said it was inherently inaccurate that it'll slap the side of the shaft and never be able to get a clean release. So I did that as well, I <laughs> showed them as well. And so these things that they adhered to, that it must always be on you know, the inside of the bow for X, 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 Y, 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 whatever, I systematically debunked every single one. And they thought that they were being historically accurate by adhering to this standard. But what it really was, was a misconception that arose through tradition and people repeating, just oh, assuming that because most people do it this way, that's the best way to do it. But when looking at historical art, no, actually, historically, they did it on both sides and it was preference of the archer, whatever they preferred. And there's really interesting benefits and genuine benefits shooting on the outside of the bow with a heavy war bow. And so this is just one example of excessive pendantry achieving the very opposite of what people are assuming by being so pedantic, which is historical accuracy, but they legitimately started to try and spread the falsehood that of medieval archery, saying that it was only ever done one way and this way it was never done at all. And when I say it, these were actually respected people in the medieval archery community, archers, instructors, boyers, and everything. And the amount of nonsense that they were trying to gaslight me with about this was next level. A lot of it came, I think, and it's my own opinion, perhaps I'm reading too much into it, but I think a lot of the resistance came from feeling threatened to their own credibility. Because they had claimed a certain way was this way for so long, that when some weird guy on YouTube comes along and proves them all categorically wrong, they felt that a threat to their authority and they doubled and tripled down, even in the face of categorical evidence to the contrary. And there's a lot more in regards to medieval archery that I think I might do a dedicated video on regarding misconceptions about medieval war bows, because there's a lot. But we're not done! I mean, it goes again and again. You probably know heaps of kind of pendant, you know, objections people raise, right? That are actually nonsense. If you do, share them in the comments. I'll be interested, because sometimes they're not nonsense. Sometimes there's validity, but sometimes they are. Tyrant, you have something to share on this topic. Yes, I am the devil's advocate for this video. Genuinely, you mm -hmm. are, I agree with you in a lot of these circumstances. Mm -hmm. However, a point where I would interject is, 
a lot of it can be brought down to best practice. Mm -hmm. For example, let's talk about how, which way you would store the blade. I agree mm -hmm. that it's not going to blunt the blade, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you have a very, very well uh, crafted sheath or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. But best practice, storing it down. Then you have, abs well, you have absolutely zero chance of it blunting the blade at that, t at that point. Except when you draw it and it can rub the top. That is true, but best practices. I don't know. For a lot see, of these things, because most people don't have an entire wall of swords. Yeah. Most people have one. But see, this is the thing, right? The amount of potential damage that you could give a sword, right, mm. from it resting like this, mm. is nowhere near worse than when you take it out of your sheath and you're handling it and you're moving it. In actual fact, moving it around like this That's will I cause said. it to rub against the edge more. Right. And when you do this and put it on, I see no damage that you could possibly That's give That's why I said I agree with you. However, when it comes mm. down to a lot of these things, a reason why I would say tradition, mm. I would say more best practice. When you're trying to extend the shelf life of your... Ah, uh, see, this is where I object, because in this instance, specifically the way that the sword is held, yeah. right? I can see no actual functional validity to the claim that this is a better practice holding it like that on a sheath I agree. versus especially that. if your sheath on is, is perfectly crafted i wouldn't mm. even want the sheath touching the edge of the blade if i knew it was terribly and i knew that mm. it was going to rub on that edge i would store it like this just to be sure well see i think personal preference exact do it the way you want but to try and claim that even with badly made sheaths yeah. that it's going to damage as like to it's, me that's that's just nonsense it's not going to damage it's not going <laughs> to damage, not gonna damage. <laughs> that is uh that is true good point though thank you because that is the take it's personal preference right but it's the appeal to oh you have to do it because of this and and the categorical assertion that it will damage come on it's not going to damage it. yeah. something also that i mm. like is uh, i like wielding katanas one-handed and yes. I know that's a no-no. I know you're not supposed to. It's supposed to be a, a, a double-handed weapon. Did anyone notice that that katana is in the wrong scabbard? The wrong sayer? Like it literally doesn't fit. <laughs> uh, I personally believe, and I'm ready for all those comments, that if you're strong enough and you have enough in your wrist and in your forearm mm. strength to wield it one-handed. Now, I know you're not supposed to, Mm. But I personally prefer to do This that. is interesting because if you like it that way, all power to you, mm. right? I, like, would you have anything in your offhand? Because I would say if you're not using your offhand for anything, what are you losing out in using two hands versus one? Different strikes feel more comfortable. You know something in addition, right? And some people don't know this, is that you can get more reach in one hand mm. versus because to get two hands on it, you have to actually exactly. pull it back and you can't reach as far. And so that's a perfectly valid reason to prefer one. And if you've got the strength and exactly. you can handle it. I feel like I'm able to move more fluidly. Uh, fluid, 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 fluidly? Fluidly, yeah. Fluidly. Move more fluidly yeah. with uh, one hand and I can still. Uh, Guess what? The person with the greatest insight as to how effective and comfortable you use a sword is, is you. you. Oh, isn't that crazy? And how stupid would it be to, for me to come and say, no, you're going to be better doing it this other way if you have valid reasons and you have found in practice that you fight better this way versus the way I'm trying to force you to do. And more often than not, I feel like using two hands mm -hmm. hamstrings me and it makes it mm -hmm. actually harder for me to move. You're the one who has the insight yeah. to that, okay? And then to appeal to the fact that oh, most people do it with two hands and you're just completely wrong, right? Just contradicts the fact that you know you better than me. Now it's different if I went out there and said, this is the way you gotta do it. Yeah, if you, you, say, if you tried to force this your preference on me. This is a better way to do me, it, then it's a different story. A different, but to say this works better for me is completely valid and I have an exact equivalent example in this which is the next topic in regards to swordsmanship techniques it's the wrong well, do you want to put it in the right one yeah yeah, yeah let's just do let's that just, shall we <laughs> <laughs> i had this interesting discussion someone was criticizing a swordsman for his technique and they said he was leaning too far forward and i responded in saying I don't see an issue with that. I like to lean forward. In fact, when I sometimes I even hunch in my sword, sword, sword stance, where when I'm like this, I will hunch a bit like that because it helps me rest more in between bouts. And if I have medical issues in which my fatigue is a big problem, and so taking on a stance in which I can conserve energy like that is actually way more beneficial to me. But it kicked off this debate with a specific uh, individual, but he was like saying, I shouldn't do this. It's wrong in every instance and i was thinking no, no 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 hang on this works for me this is what this this is how i choose to do it and my largest point is that leaning forward in a stance is perfectly fine in fact very valid 
and there's nothing wrong with that. And even if you hunch a bit leaning forward, if it works for you, do it. And then to appeal that there is a universal way that you must stance in every single instance, that's wrong. To argue that there's certain benefits to standing a different way, that might work for some people, fine. But then to say, you must do it this way because it will work better for you. But hang on, you're not me. You don't know how I fight and what's better for me the when way I practice. I personally view it, my personal philosophy on it is things like martial arts or whatever mm. uh, school of training you're learning is the guidelines. They will teach mm. you how to do it properly and safely, but then you are yourself. Mm -hmm. Some things won't work for you. Yes. Sometimes with the way you're standing, it won't feel right, it won't mm -hmm. feel natural, it might hamstring you. I feel like a tailored approach for any of these things is always the way This to go. is why I love Bruce Lee's philosophy. It's the philosophy of Jeet Kune Do. Absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, and keep what is essentially your own. I, I, I was gonna bring it up, but I didn't know if you'd know what I was talking about. No, I know, exactly. <laughs> I, I love that philosophy. When I was getting to martial arts, that was the philosophy I followed, mm. where I just wanted to absorb anything that worked for me. And if something worked for someone else and I tried it, it wasn't as good for me because my natural reflexes, the way my body moved, my inclination philosophy of how I think when I fight, exactly. it just didn't work for me. It's like, no, I'm not going to use it. And to say that I must, you know, but when I applied, like when I applied this to HEMA, I made a video a long time ago called The Problem with HEMA, mm. where I pointed out that there were people in the HEMA community, I think it's less now, um, <laughs> even Dave Rawlings recently did a video that said, this issue doesn't exist anymore, where a lot of people in the HEMA community are perfectly happy for you to do things your own way. And that's great, that's great. But when I made this video, I was pointing out, because I had direct people coming to me saying, you're doing X, Y, Z wrong. It must be done this way. And I was like, no, I, I the only what if it doesn't take, work for me? I would no? take issue with it is if you're trying to teach people. Like if you're saying that this mm. is the way to do it okay. and it's your personal way. There are instances when people are tr teaching legitimately bullcrap techniques mm. like McDojo's and stuff. <laughs> I agree with all I absolutely call out the bullcrap. But there are some instances where someone is doing something that just works for them. And if it's actually working, you can see it working in fighting yeah. inspiring, like, and winning the exchanges. Well, there's a reason why the UFC became so big is because all mm. of a sudden all these fake martial arts and all these <laughs> techniques that don't work in a realistic situation. Like for example, I'm not gonna call out any specific uh, 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 martial arts, but there are- Zhu Xiao Dong versus traditional Chinese. Zhu Xiao Dong, you're a legend. There are specific techniques that only work against other practitioners. Who and, are being very submissive and compliant. Yes, and once you apply that to- uh, A resisting opponent. It's a different story. It's bull crap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but I just wanted to add that Thank a lot you. of it could be boiled down to just best practices. Not that I agree, mm -hmm. I'm just saying if I was to advocate for it, okay, I'd say okay. I would put it in that category. In some ways I would fight for and agree, but other ways I would say it's not a best practice. The, 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 what you're trying to appeal to as a best practice isn't even that. So it's there are case certain by case. situations, it's case yeah, by case. case certain by situations case. where I'd say it's best practice. Other times, no. <laughs> My best practice to like at least clean the sword after. Like yes, around. best practice, clean your swords if you don't want them to rust. It's not to say never touch it. So there's actually a lot more. You probably know more that I haven't even mentioned. So I was sincere. I'd like to hear them in the comments below where people say you should not do X or do Y. And this is more in relation to modern day practices, not necessarily about historical information about what swords were. Well, I know we have mentioned sword terminology in the modern day. Nate mentioned an interesting one that people have told him literally in real life that if a shield doesn't have a boss, it's not a real shield. It's just like, what? What, what, is, what, what is that? Yeah, that one. Yeah, very weird. Uh, there are some people who say you should always hold a shield like this up against the body and then say, no, better practice up like this. Whatever works for you. You try both and see, because this is more rested and it's easier to maintain, but perhaps use both, who knows? Or, or preference one if it works for you, okay? There's a lot of it. You see it in comments, you see it on the internet, and I got a wave of comments of people losing their crap about the way a katana was being <laughs> rest, like, rested on a sword stand and the direction it was pointing, and it was just like the reasons they gave. Okay, there are some, like I mentioned, traditional things if you want to be traditional, but outside of that, okay, let's not take it so far, all right? And if so, if, and even if people want to abuse their swords, if they know that, like, if they have reasons to do it, just let them, it's their swords, don't get bent out of shape, as long as you get to do what you want to do with your swords, I get to do what I like to do with my swords, and we should encourage everyone to be safe, but don't 
go Karen on everywhere. It must be like this way or that way, okay? So I wanted to share that with you, get it off my chest as it were. Thank you everyone for watching and uh, I will see you on the next video here on Shadowversity. Until that time, farewell. I wonder if I can draw a sword in this position. Actually, it works. It works.